Orphan Boy returns to the past and becomes the most powerful magician, capable of negating any magic. The anime starts with a scene of ruins and dead bodies spread out as far as the eye can reach. Then gigantic footsteps are heard, followed by the appearance of a massive volcanic dragon in a massive cloud of dust. Six humans are in front of him. The dragon informs them that no simple human can beat him and that they are foolish to even try. A narrator now speaks of the shadow world, the darkest tragedy humanity has ever faced, gradually enveloping their reality in black fog. Whatever the black fog covers dies, and in order to rescue the world, the shadow realm must be conquered in order to prevent the black fog from spreading. Boromir creates a massive fireball and shoots it at them, but the fireball dies in midair due to the effect of one of the human's spells. Boromir creates another massive fireball in its hands, but it is destroyed once more by the human's magic. The human declares that he has studied and sealed Boromir's magic. At this point, three of his companions charge Boromir, and he tries to swat them away with his tail. One of the humans produces a magical shield, easily blocking Boromir's strike, while two others attack Boromir. The first attacker, a male, smashes the earth, while the second attacker, a female, gets blessed with the magic of the entire group by a wizard who stands far behind the group. She slays Boromir with her magically improved blade. The humans are relieved that they have defeated the dragon and can finally escape the shadow world in which they have been trapped. But the male attacker is concerned, claiming that the cleared message is late, and that they may have killed the incorrect target. Another human convinces him that killing Boromir was the last thing they needed to do to rid the shadow world. We learn that there were 150 million people assigned to take down Boromir, and only six of them survived. One of the men in the group reflects on the people he fought beside and how many of them died in previous fights. He determined that it wasn't a win worth celebrating because they had sacrificed so much to obtain it. They had lost 99% of the warriors sent to defeat the great dragon and that they needed to think about the future and what that entailed. Boromir's eyes suddenly open and he begins to glow bright red, with streaks of light emanating from his breast. The group is surprised by this incident because they assumed he was done for. The male attacker claims Boromir is no longer alive, but then recalls something about dragon hearts. He informs the group of what he discovered in an old manuscript. It is said that dragon hearts do more than just pump blood, they also store and circulate mana. When dragons die, the mana they have stored has nowhere to go. Boromir will explode from the mana trapped in his heart. Desir tries to counter the dragon's magic, but his spells are ineffective, and the company prepares to die. Desir's life flashes before his eyes, followed by pure whiteness. The picture shifts to a younger version of Desir standing in a corridor lined with pillars. He opens his eyes and looks down at his hands, surprised to find himself still alive. Desir hears an ovation to his left and goes over to see students clapping as a woman comes up a podium towards a lector. The lady greets the new students at Hebrian Academy. Desir recognizes the woman and addresses her as Professor Bridget. Professor Bridget informs the students that not everyone in attendance will be accepted into the academy. She informs them that they will each take a test. She tells them the test is to clear a shadow realm, and Desir says the same thing she does as if he knew she was going to say it. Desir has no idea what is going on when the professor announces the start of the 3613 admission exam. Desir moves away from the audience to a nearby wall to balance himself. Desir is surprised to find himself at the entrance exams for the year 3613, recalling that his war with Boromir began in the year 3616 and lasted 10 years. Desir begins to cry, remembering the war and the losses they experienced, and laments that it was all for naught. Desir collapses to his knees, absolutely defeated. The scene shifts to Desir sitting on the entry stairs to the academy, convinced that he is not in a dream because everything he sees and knows appears to be true. A female suddenly interrupts his thoughts by reaching out to him. A girl calls out to him, interrupting his thoughts. She informs him that he was not present at their meeting location and inquires if he is not Desir Herman. Desir apologizes and introduces himself as Ladoria Dorich. She informs him that she is a second-year student and that she will be his mentor, and she requests that he address her as Ladoria. Desir recalls her as a fire magic wielding and the top student in the academy's rankings. Ladoria approaches Desir as he is buried in thought, and he admits to being apprehensive about the test. She reassures him that it's simply a test to determine how strong he is. She checks his information on her tab and asks him whether he is a commoner. Desir says it's not a necessity for registration, but even if he passes, he'll be placed in the beta class. Desir remembered the school putting nobility in the alpha class and commoners in the beta class. This meant that commoners, regardless of their magical aptitude, could never get a decent education. 
wasting the talent of countless mages. Desir and Ladoria walk approach a building, where Ladoria enters a door with her key card. Suddenly, speakers erected in the corridors echo an announcer's voice, stating that the exam will begin soon and that all candidates should meet at the test location. Desir realizes and confirms that he has returned to his past, and he searches for his best buddy, who died in the Battle of Boromir. Suddenly, a voice from behind him tells him to quit looking around and to calm down. Desir turns around to see Romantica. He is inundated with memories of her death and makes a firm commitment to prevent that tragedy from happening again by changing his world's history. Desir gives Romantica an intense look in return. He cries out her name, relieved that she is safe, but then he realizes he is in the past. She is shocked that he recognizes her name and inquires if they had ever met. Desir apologizes and informs her that he saw her name on a massive holographic screen that was projected above the arena. Desir is in the same testing group as Romantica, thus Romantica wishes him luck. Desir can't help but watch her walk away. Desir recalls how heartbroken he was when he lost her and pledges never to put her in such a situation again. Desir meets up with Ladoria again, and she informs him of his new group. She informs him that the first test will be a beginner level race in the Shadow World. She assures him once more that the shadow worlds employed in the academy are harmless and only used to assess students. She informs him of the safety mechanism in place, but Elheim interrupts her. He informs Desir that pupils are permitted to attack one another. Elheim reveals his mentee, Aziz Kingscrown, a magical knight. Desir remembers her as a magical knight of ice who wields vision magic that cannot be reversed. He also recalls her being incredibly proficient with her blade. Desir believes she will be a trustworthy ally. Ladoria looks her up on her student tablet but isn't overjoyed. Elheim mockingly wonders if she's alright. Ladoria tells him he got lucky in finding a talented mentee. Elheim tells her that his mentee suits his virtue, which is why she was assigned a commoner as a mentee. Elheim walks away smiling, and Ladoria is plainly irritated by his statement. At that point, the voice announcer announces the start of the exam for Desir's group. The speaker instructs the participants to gather at the gate. Ladoria wishes Desir luck on his journey. Desir can't help but cast a sidelong glance at Romantica as all six contestants wait before the entrance. A portal appears, and all participants pass through it. Everyone appears in a field surrounded by trees. The voice announcer welcomes them to the Shadow World's Erensti Grasslands. The announcer shows them the finish line and goes over the rules with them. Everyone lines up at the start line after hearing the regulations. Desir wonders if Aziz returned with her memories after both of them survived the Battle of Boromir. Aziz says Desir's entire name. He is taken aback and wonders how she knows his name. She informs him she looked him up on the list of participants. She informs him he is the lowest ranked competitor, and that no matter how hard he trains, he has no future. Desir confirms that she did not return with her memories. Aziz assures him that he need not be afraid of her because she has no intention of battling weak people. Desir expresses gratitude. The countdown begins, and the race begins. Aziz sprints away from the group, leaving the other in the dust. Desir and Romantica are inseparable. In her haste, Romantica knocks over a fluffy creature. She apologizes after witnessing how adorable the creature is. Desir notices she still likes such things and confronts her about it. She asks him what he means and informs him that he knows nothing about her. A flash emerged from between the trees in front of them at that moment. Desir shoves Romantica away, and a ball of flame flies past her. Desir is told to cease interfering in other people's lives by the person who fired the fireball. He decides to prioritize Desir's care. He creates a new fire assault and directs it at Desir. Romantica summons her own magic and strikes the fireball with a wind strike. This creates a dust cloud. Romantica's wind strike is still functioning, unbeknownst to the attacker. It strikes the attacker, inflicting great injury on him. This automatically removes him from the arena. The announcer informs him that he has been disqualified from the exam owing to prenatal harm. Desir says Romantica owes him one for saving her from disqualification. She expresses gratitude to him for watching out for her. She informs him that her blocking of the attacker's second strike has brought them even. She agrees with her, still smiling sheepishly. Romantica is visibly upset and orders him to stop making that face. Desir simply laughs it off. He informs her that they have a lot of territory to cover because the others were well ahead of them. Romantica informs him that she planned to save her powers for later, but she has no choice but to demonstrate them now. Two runners are trailing Aziz, who is currently in first place, into the woodland. 
one of them notices how swiftly she runs and believes he can finish second if he keeps up his current pace. A powerful wind blew towards him, blowing away the second contestant who was nearby. To anchor himself, he plunges his blade into the ground. When he looked up, he was taken aback to see Aziz cutting through the wind storm. He admits she is a magical knight and wishes to prove himself in the same way she has. Suddenly, a tree next to him is uprooted by the force of the wind and crushes him. He is automatically removed from the arena. Both players are disqualified after sustaining fatal damage, according to the voice announcer. She informs Desir that because there are only three individuals left, they will both qualify. Then her voice changes to a nasty tone and she asks Desir if he believes that's how he'll qualify. She informs him that he is the next person on her list to be eliminated. She tells him that his face irritates her so much that she can't bear seeing him qualify. Desir simply smiles at her. Romantica is enraged by his smile and prepares a devastating assault, shining with a green aura. She tells Desir that she offered him an opportunity, but because he didn't take it, there will be no more. She conjures up multiple magical circles in the sky. She assures Desir that her attack would be extremely painful, but he should not be concerned because he cannot die in the test arena. She directs her attack at Desir. Her assault creates a dust cloud. She waves goodbye to Desir and turns to go away. As he emerges from the dust cloud, Desir expresses his admiration for her ability to handle so many magical circles. Romantica returns his gaze, amazed that he was not eliminated. Desir informs her that because she stresses speed with her strike, she lacks control. He advises her that even a minor change in her attack trajectory will cause it to miss its objective. His arrogance irritates Romantica even more. She raises additional magical circles above her head and prepares to assault once more. She throws an attack at him, and he informs her it's the same as the last time. He alters the wind's path, and her attacks miss him once more. She can't believe what she's seeing. Desir performed an inverse spell to shift her assault direction, which she observes. She is aware that Desir is the lowest rated magician, and that only mages ranked higher than others may reversal their spells. She doubts Desir's ability to reverse her spells. She tries another attack on Desir, but the result is the same. When he reverses it, her magic disintegrates. Romantica can't believe her eyes once more. She mulls over the possibility of Desir having skills far superior to hers. Desir asks whether they can finish the game. He walks approaches her, claiming he has others to defeat and can't afford to waste time. Romantica is terrified and, in her desperation, unleashes more magical attacks than she has previously. She's attempting to overload Desir with the quantity of spells she has so that he can't reverse them. She casts several spells against him, but he reverses them all. He recognizes Romantica's strength among the incoming students, but he believes she is still insufficient. He believes that if she continues in this manner, she may die in the future. He determines that he must win that struggle in order for her to grow stronger. Desir and Versus all receive magical sources, and Romantica appears depleted. Desir informs her that she has made multiple mistakes. He informs her that spell inversion is not the only thing he is capable of. He casts a magical charm that decreases friction on his feet. He informs her that the second thing she failed to see was that he was not battling her. He informs her that the last item she ignored was the fact that they were assessed on their ability to cross the finish line rather than their magical abilities. Desir warns her that they can't die in the test arena and trigger fire magic just behind him. Desir fires a fireball that propels him forward with such power that he knocks Romantica over. Desir's performance has wowed Romantica. Azist is nearing the finish line and rushing towards it when she notices something approaching her from behind. Desir emerges from a clump of trees behind her, driven by the flaming ball. Azus recognizes that if he is not stopped, he will overrun her. She retracts her statement, recognizing that he is strong. She promises to defeat him with everything she has. Desir comes to a halt as she casts so many spells, preparing to attack her. He inverts them one at a time. Azus attacks before he can reverse them all, but he adjusts the trajectory of her spells, and they all miss. She unleashes a massive magical strike on him. Desir modifies the trajectory of her spell, leveraging its impact force to propel himself across the finish line. She starts to draw her blade, but he brushes her aside, saying she was too concentrated on battling him. Desir crosses the finish line and is declared the Group D winner. In a large room, everyone examines the test results, magic circles, and family histories. It is clarified that those factors will be used to allocate students to classes. The examiners observe that the Alpha class does not include any commoners. Naturally, this makes them happy, as the Alpha class ought to raise the chosen rather than the ignorant commoners. After a few minutes, everyone is checking to see where they have been assigned. Desir was placed in the Beta class but he's more concerned about Romantica 
who is equally surprised to be in the same class as him. The classes begin swiftly. The teacher then declares that their abilities are insufficient for the real shadow realms and begins mocking everyone. Romantica begins to wonder if she was passed over for the Alpha class because of the previous incident. Her main issue right now is being sat near Desir's side. She's perplexed as to how he's in this class after defeating the Magical Knight. Desir then glances at her and smiles. She becomes enraged and smashes her desk. Desir then recalls his time in the Beta class and his talk with Bridget. Desir originally complimented her for her assistance at the orphanage. She's thrilled he remembered her, and even more pleased that he grew up to be a wonderful mage. She expresses her surprise that he could defeat Azist. She then confesses that she attempted to make him an Alpha class student. But the other pitiful professors were opposed because Desir is a commoner. Desir is irritated by everything because she apologized to him. He is aware that the nobles are erecting a barrier between themselves and the commoners in order to be perceived as superiors. However, he recognizes that they are being misled because there are so many students in beta class who will grow more stronger in the future. He then makes his selection. He intends to awaken as many talented individuals as possible. Romantica is still looking for a solution to her sadness after class. Someone approaches her and inquires if she is the daughter of Baron Iru. She confirms and inquires about his identity. The man announces himself as an Alpha class student in search of party members. He invites her to his Blue Moon party, which is the best party in the academy and is only attended by the top students in the Alpha class. He explains that he wants her in his party because of her abilities and family history. She starts thinking about it, thinking she might be promoted to the Alpha class. However, something happens just as she is ready to respond. The guy grabs her hand and tells her that if she joins, she must also become his girlfriend. Romantica is perplexed and responds timidly, asking what he is on about. Like most of us, he's probably lying when he says his feelings are genuine. He spotted her at the admission ceremony and, like the sad loser he is, fell in love at first sight. He takes her hand once more, remarking that a clever noble like her should not be partnered with filthy commoners in the beta class. He encourages her to join him, but she wants time to think about it. Before leaving, the man takes a random gift from his pocket. He explains that people in his hometown give things to someone they love. When she opens it, she discovers a gold jewelry inside. She attempts to refuse, but this pitiful playboy tells her she must accept and walks away. Desir appears from behind her, frightening her to death. He remarks that she handled the fall admirably. She gets up and asks Desir what he wants. Desir boldly states that he is here to suggest the same thing he did. Romantica, of course, misinterprets it and asks who wants to be his girlfriend. Desir just responds that he didn't care about her. He merely wants her to come along to his party. She scolds him confidently, stating that she was just invited to the best party in the academy. She will be successful if she joins them, especially when up against a party formed by a student in the beta class. She instructs him to go away, but Desir feels compelled to use his last resort. He places a note on top of her desk and instructs her to read it while no one is looking. Of course, she assumes it's a love letter and begins mocking him. Desir, on the other hand, merely tells her to throw away the letter after reading it, or else something bad will happen to her. He then exits the classroom, leaving her perplexed. She takes a look around before opening the letter to read it. Her facial expression shifts seconds later, as if she is filled with hatred. We return to Desir, who is wondering whether Romantica will be angry or cry. He's fairly certain she'll be upset, but his attention is drawn to a butterfly near another pupil. He understands that he has found the person he was looking for. This is Pram, the fastest swordsman among the soldiers who fought before Desir's return. Pram, according to Desir, was quite strong for someone who had little training in their initial era. But this time, he'll make certain Pram becomes even stronger. Meanwhile, Romantica locates Desir and attempts to question him about the contents of the letter. Desir instructs her to keep quiet because practice is about to begin. She stares at Pram, whom she simply regards as a cute lad. Just staring at his face transports her to another world. Meanwhile, Pram examines the practice weapons and selects a magnificent sword. Desir is perplexed. He doesn't understand why Pram chose that one. Pram then walks to the arena's center and announces himself. His opponent, who deserves to be punched in the face, refuses to announce himself because he is an alpha-class noble. The referee begins the duel and Pram charges forward. He manages to push the arrogant aristocrat back, startling him with his strength. Pram continues to strike in quick succession, irritating the noble even more as he is driven back. Romantica believes Pram is quite strong, but Desir feels something is up. Pram is swinging his blade about at random. The noble launches an attack and gains the upper hand. 
Desir, on the other hand, believes Pram is capable of dealing with it. Pram deflects every attack and prepares to hit the heroic fellow. Desir recognizes that now is not the time to do it. The nobleman avoids the onslaught and knocks Pram's weapon from his grasp. Pram eventually admits defeat. Pram did his best, but he lost, and Romantica recognizes this. She's also perplexed as to why Pram chose a great sword. Desir then realizes something, but he must first act. The nobility was enraged by what had just occurred and punched Pram. Desir rushes up to Pram, and the noble not only punches but also kicks him. He promptly picks up Pram and informs the nobility that the combat is over. Of course, this cocky guy threatens Desir to stop up or he will be treated similarly. Desir merely responds that the nobility is envious of Pram's talent. The man becomes upset and attempts to attack Desir. Desir, on the other hand, not only blocks the strike, but also manages to destroy the guy's wooden sword. The noble cannot believe his eyes, but Desir questions whether the man wishes to lose his teeth after winning the duel. The noble becomes terrified and chooses to flee. Of course, he had to threaten Desir first, because he is a typical loser. Pram insists on inspecting Desir's arm after the incident. Desir explains that he utilized magic to deflect the attack, therefore he's alright. Romantica eventually refers to Desir as reckless, exactly as he did during the entrance exam. Pram then completes the arm examination and apologizes to Desir, stating that it would be inconvenient for a while. Desir denies it, stating that he chose to get involved. Pram is still depressed since Desir has become an enemy of someone in the Alpha class. Romantica is having her, he's so cute at the moment, but Desir warns her that she will be kicked if she doesn't calm down. He then assures Pram that he is fine because he can defeat everyone in the Alpha class. Pram then remembers he hasn't introduced himself, so everyone follows him. However, because he insists on being addressed by his first name rather than his surname. Of course, when Desir does this, Pram turns tomato red. Desir remains silent despite his confusion because Pram appears to be content. Pram thanks Desir again and departs after everything is arranged. Desir then turns to Romantica and inquires as to what she wishes to discuss with him. They go outside, and she questions him about what he wrote in the letter. Desir claims that only he is aware of it, although the instructors are also aware. That's why, despite being a noble with incredible magical abilities, she was demoted to the beta class. Desir then begins telling a story about a merchant who became wealthy through commerce. He was a commoner who got wealthy enough to purchase a title from a destitute noble. Desir then describes an incident that occurred when Romantica was about four years old, and that she is the merchant's daughter. He then explains how aristocrats think to her. Even if her father had enough money to purchase a noble title, she was born as a commoner. As a result, she was assigned to the beta class. Desir then says that she should refuse to attend Blue Moon because it is a gathering for nobility exclusively. Romantica declines violently, explaining that the other person will defend her. Desir then asks if she recalls what he said about commoners. That recollection returns to her, and she recalls the other guy stating, filthy commoners. Desir explains that if the other guy finds out about her family's roots, he will do something to her. He then asks her to his party again, stating that if she does not attend, he will. Romantica cuts him off, believing he's blackmailing her. She fears he would tell everyone she is from a commoner household. But Desir is perplexed since he would never do such a thing. She asks him to explain himself, and Desir simply answers that if she refuses to join, he and Pram will have to start on their own. Romantica begins to fantasize about how cute Pram will be around Desir, and believes it's not fair. Desir is suspicious to her for various reasons. He's usually smiling creepily at her, he knows about her family, and he's pretty reckless. However, she eventually agrees to join his party. She does, however, pledge to reveal all of his secrets. Desire prepares to knock on a door. T, Romantica, and Pram are standing together. Romantica is a bit skeptical about his proceeding. He assures her he has spoken to some people and put everything in place. He knocks on the door and introduces himself. A female voice tells him to enter the office. Professor Bridget tells him he has enough members to form a party. She asks Desire to give her his reasons for wanting to form a party. Desire tells her he wants to get promoted to the Alpha class by winning the ranking tournament. Both Romantica and Pram look at Desire, shock written over her face. Professor Bridget asks him if he knows how difficult it is to accomplish his goal. He tells her he knows that. Pram asks her if getting promoted is really that difficult. She tells him it's no mere feat. She starts her explanation by telling him how the ranking tournament works. She tells him the ranking tournament is an exam done to determine the ranks of students in each grade. She tells him the exam is conducted with the Alpha and Beta class being together. 
The eligibility for participation is to form a party of three to six members. She tells him the exam is basically a battle between two parties and the winning party's rank goes up. She explains to them that winning the battle between parties is more than just defeating the opponents, supporting teammates, intercepting the enemies and general contribution to the battle will all be considered. She tells them the objective of the ranking tournament is to assess the various individual skills of the students. She tells them all the mentioned criteria are just for the qualifying round. She tells them the winning parties will participate in the final rounds. She tells them the final rounds take place in a shadow world and the top 9 ranked students are given the title of single rankers. She tells them if they can achieve the title of single ranker, they will be promoted from the beta to the alpha class. That's why the ranking tournament is also called a promotional tournament. She tells them no one has ever been promoted in the history of the academy. Romantica tells her there's no surprise that no one has been promoted. She tells the professor that the alpha class has a substantial advantage over the beta class. She tells the professor it will be completely one-sided. Professor Bridget tells her she is right because, in the past, the top rankers were from the alpha class. She tells them it's honestly impossible to be promoted. Desire tells her that's the very reason why he wants to be promoted. She tells them if they could become single rankers, they could be the catalyst needed to change the rotten system of the academy. Desire agrees with her. She likes his spirit and determination. Professor Bridget addresses Romantica and Pram, asking for their agreement to join Desire's party after hearing his goal. They both agree to do so. They leave the professor's office. Walking down the hallway, Romantica observes the school's training room. Romantica tells the group she didn't know the school had a place like that. Desire tells her only the Alpha class is allowed to use it. They stop at a different door and Desire tells her that's the room they will be staying in. Desire opens the door, and the room looks like Shrek ran through it. It looks more like a haunted house rather than a common room. Romantica asks Desire if he's sure they are at the right place. As Romantica walks into the room the floorboards creak. Romantica and Pram complain about the floorboards and the dust covering the room. But Desire assures them they can make do with it. Just then the eyes of several creatures glow red. Pram faints from fear. He later wakes up sitting on the staircase leading to the training room. He walks to the doorstep and checks in on the progress of the group. The room looks entirely different, bright, clean and cozy. Now that he's awake, Desire asks him if he's ready. Romantica, who has been sitting on a chair looking dejected, raises her head and tells him she's ready to go back and take a shower. But Desire has other plans, he wants them to begin training. Romantica tells him she shouldn't have joined him. With a heavy sigh, she agrees to join him for training. She walks away from him towards a room but Desire tells her she's going the wrong way and shows her the right room. Desire draws a circle on the wall and Romantica casts her magic, hitting the circle on the wall with it. She tells Desire she can easily hit the target. Desire tells her to try to hit the center of the circle with multiple magic strikes. She tells him it's impossible, but he tells her they won't stand a chance against the Alpha class if she doesn't. Desire knows she can do it because she was able to do it in the future he came from. Desire tells her if she isn't confident enough to pull it off, she can just be a cleaner of the room till she graduates. Romantica is frustrated with Desire and his smile. Desire draws two circles some distance apart. Romantica stands in one circle and Desire gives her a ball. He tells her to get the ball into the other circle. Romantica tries to throw it but Desire stops her, telling her she must use her magic. He tells her to manipulate the air currents around the ball to push it into the circle. Romantica drops the ball on the floor and tries to concentrate. Desire asks her if wind magic is her forte and she tells him it is. He tells her to just follow the basics and push the ball just like she normally would. He tells her to envision the wind. Romantica concentrates and raises the ball with her wind magic. Desire is impressed she was able to grasp the concept so quickly and commends her. Romantica is pleased she got a compliment out of him. Desire tells her to repeat the exercise while her muscle memory is still fresh. He turns to Pram, telling him it's his turn to practice. Pram is so enthusiastic, asking Desire what he would like to teach him. Desire tells him there's nothing he can teach him. Pram asks him why he can't teach him, and Desire tells him he has mastered all his skills. He tells him he can win the ranking tournament as he is now. Pram doesn't believe him. Desire remembers the sword future Pram was using and decides to ask him about the sword but he's not in a divulging mood. Desire tells him he must tell him because it concerns the welfare of the party. Pram asks Desire to come with him. They arrive at a door and they both walk in. Pram picks up the sword. Pram tells Desire he doesn't know his father, but he was a noble and his mother is a commoner. He tells Desire he was born out of wedlock and the sword was the only thing his father left behind. 
Desire asks to take a closer look at the sword and Pram presents him with it. Desire takes it from him, noting how light it is. Pram tells him he learned about the sword when he was just six years old. At that age, he learned his father left him with the sword, so he started on the path of the sword. He trained with the sword to finally see his father. But his mother always told him not to try to visit his father because he was in a different world compared to them. Pram was sad about that, but his mother consoled him. Pram tells Desire his mother never told him the name of his father till she passed away. Desire thought she made a wise decision because for nobles, having a child with a commoner is a disgrace. If Pram had visited his father, he wouldn't have been alive to tell the tale. Pram tells him he wanted to know who his father was, so he enrolled at Hebrian Academy to find him. He thought he would be able to get information about his father from the different nobles coming from different countries. He took the sword to town to get it appraised, hoping to get some information about his father. But he was told the sword had no value. Pram is angry. He thought his father loved his mother so much that he left his sword to his son. But Pram is sad the sword is worthless. He takes it off the table and throws it on the floor as tears stream down his face. Pram tells him he will never use the sword again. A few days later, Pram starts training with the great sword. Desire observes his progress. Meanwhile, Romantica thinks she has completely mastered her training with the balls. Desire tells her she hasn't mastered it fully just yet because she's not able to get the ball into the circle. Romantica is frustrated. Desire gets an idea. He rushes off to Pram and asks him to take a look at his sword again. But Pram tells him he can't show him the sword because he already sold it. Desire and Pram walk through the town market district. The place looks just like Desire remembers it. Desire remembers coming to shop in these stalls before time turned back. Pram stops him at the beginning of an alleyway. Pram points towards the alleyway and tells him the location is down the alleyway. They walk towards the door and Desire puts his hand on the metal door. He commends the security of the place. Desire uses the door knocker to knock at the door. The door opens and a huge man stares through the door crack at them. The man grants them entrance after looking them over. Desire and Pram walk towards the counter and Wu Zyukun welcomes them. Desire tells him he wants to buy Pram's rapier back. Wu Zyukun asks him if he didn't read about his no-refund policy on the sign outside. Desire tells him he wants to buy the sword. Wu Zyukun agrees and brings out the rapier. Desire walks to the counter and tells Wu Zyukun they will take the sword for 40 silvers, dropping the coins on the counter. Desire concentrates and activates his power, and he sees some inscription on the sword that makes him hold out the sword to Pram and ask him to take it. PRSM is hesitant but Desire tells him to go ahead. Pram takes the sword and Desire tells him to pull a groove on the hilt with his nail. After he does this, Desire tells him to draw the sword. Pram draws the sword, and the blade is glowing. Both Pram and Wu Zyukun are surprised. Pram looks over the sword and notices it's nothing like he has ever seen. Desire tells him he hasn't seen anything like it because the sword is made from a rare metal called Brancium. Wu Zyukun asks Desire if he's sure the sword is made from Brancium. Desire tells him the metal is harder than steel but lighter than a feather and he recalls the color of the blade was the exact one Pram used in the past. Desire and Pram begin their return to the academy, but the guard doesn't let them pass. Wu Zyukun tells him he must leave the sword behind to cross the door. The guard strikes out at Desire, but he dodges the sword strike easily. Wu Zyukun tells the guard to stop goofing around. The guard wants to strike Desire again, but Pram is protecting him with his sword drawn. The guard hesitates. Pram tells Desire to stay behind him. He tells the guard he can't watch him hurt Desire. Desire reminds him he said he would never use the sword again and this makes Pram embarrassed. Desire tells him he's just kidding and encourages him to go all out. Pram becomes confident and faces the guard. The guard charges at Pram but Pram deftly dodges his attack. Desire thinks the sword suits Desire's combat style perfectly, but he worries Pram is inexperienced and may lose. The very next moment, both the guard and Desire look like they just saw the ghost of the Flying Dutchman. They might as well have because Pram is now covered with a sea green aura and his eyes are flowing. The guard is fired up by Pram's glow and vows to defeat him. The guard jumps into the air and strikes down at Pram who dodges it easily. The guard's sword is now lodged into the wooden floor. Pram strikes at the guard quickly, injuring him a bit. The guard commends his speed. Pram keeps attacking the guard, but the guard is now in a defensive position and Pram can land any fatal hits. The guard can't counter Pram either because he's too fast and strong. Pram finally ends his series of attacks and Desire thinks he's still not used to his sword. Pram lunges at the guard and strikes at him but the guard parries his strike. He's getting used to his speed now. Pram dodges the guard's attack and aims for a vital spot. But the guard reads it and knocks him down. Pram's sword falls from his hands and the guard asks him if he's finished. 
Desire calls out to him and asks him to believe in this father. As Pram tries to grab the sword, he notices the same inscription Desire noticed and this gives him an idea. Pram picks up his sword and prepares to face the guard again. Pram dodges a series of attacks from the guard deftly and goes for the guard's weak spot. The guard thinks he's caught Pram and strikes at Pram with his sword. But Pram cuts his sword cleanly in half and knocks him down with the hilt of his sword. Desire runs over to him and asks him if he's alright. Pram is happy he was able to defeat the guard saying he wouldn't have been able to without the sword and his father. Desire is happy for him, and they prepare to leave the store. Back at the academy, Romantica keeps practicing her wind magic and finally gets a ball inside the target circle. She is happy she finally completed her test but she's sad no one was around to see her do it. She falls to her feet but gets back up and tries out her wind magic on the ball to test her control. She hits her mark accurately which makes her overjoyed. Later in the day, Romantica stands outside the training room of the Alpha class. Donta calls out to her and walks up to her. He thanked her for waiting. Dona asks her if she's come to give him a reply to his earlier proposal. She tells him she has indeed come to do that. Dota assumes her answer will be yes and tells her they better be on their way so he can introduce her to the other members of the Blue Moon Party. Romantica drops the chemuvin he gave her on the table and tells him she wants to return it to him. Dota doesn't look pleased with her decision. He tells her he doesn't understand why she decided to return it. She tells him she has joined a party in the beta class. Romantica reminds Dota of how he said the students in the beta class were commoners who were nothing more than thrash. He tells her that commoners are thrash. Romantica asks him if he won't make a change to his statement. Dota tells her there's no way he was going back on those words. Romantica tells him she used to be a commoner, and a grim expression crosses Dota's face. Romantica smiles and tells him he looks scary. Dota wipes the expression off his face and tells her to stop goofing around. She tells him she wasn't kidding, and she was indeed a commoner. That's why she was put in the beta class despite the fact that she is now a noble. She tells Donda she's fine with that and no one in her party will look at her with the same expression of disgust that he used to look at her. Donda tells her if he knew she was once a commoner, he would never have invited her to his party. Romantica accepts her fate and gets up from the table. She tells Donda that her party is planning to get promoted to the Alpha class, which makes them enemies. Donda vows to crush them all. Romantica tells him not to look down on them because they are in the beta class. She walks away, thanking him for the meal once again. During the qualifying round of the tournament, Desire's group faces off against several groups, which they easily knock out. They make it to the top 30 participants, making Pram and Romantica happy. However, Desire is anticipating matching against tougher opponents. Meanwhile, Professor Fergman meets Aziz's group. Professor Fergman is angry that a beta class team could potentially be promoted to the alpha class. He loses his cool and tells the group that they can't let the beta class taint their reputation. He angrily tells the group to use any means necessary to knock out Desire's group on the last day of ranking. He tells Aziz not to allow Desire's group to become single rankers. Aziz recalls the race battle she lost to Desire. He was the first one to give her a taste of defeat and she wants to defeat him with everything she has. Meanwhile, Desire wonders if it's time to take Romantica and Pram's training to the next level. Desire walks into the training room to see Romantica hype they were able to make it to the final round of the ranking test. She asks Desire what training they would be doing but Desire tells them they won't be training. Desire takes them to the library and dumps several books in front of them. Desire tells them they need to study history because the final round will take place in a shadow world prepared by the Academy. He tells them that historical events are recreated in the shadow worlds, and they can only clear the shadow world if they can stop the incidents from happening. Romantica thinks it's impossible to know which event will be reproduced. Desire replies he picked up random events, but in reality, he already knows which shadow world the test will be. Minutes later, Aziz walks towards Desire. Desire says it has been over two months since they saw each other, and he heard that she joined Blue Moon. He commends her for making a smart choice. She asks him why and he replies that she deserves to be in the strongest party in the academy. However, she thinks the strongest party is the one Desire belongs to. She wants to tell him the reason she came to see him, but he cuts her off telling her she came to see him to declare war. She tells him she won't lose to him again. On the day of the tournament, there are four stages with portal gates leading to the Shadow World. The announcer reveals the participants must solve a certain incident to clear the Shadow World. They are allowed to use magic, interference, and other methods to clear the world. She tells them they will be disqualified if they receive fatal damage. Those who contribute to clearing the Shadow World will receive more points and the top 9 students will receive the title of single rankers. Pram notices they are at the bottom of the ranking table. 
Desire tells him they must clear the shadow world themselves or reach the top nine. The final round begins, and the portal gates open. Everyone steps through the gates into the portal and is placed randomly inside the shadow world. Desire spawns in the middle of a forest and decides to find his teammates. Suddenly, an ice bolt appears out of nowhere, but Desire dodges it. Blue Hair appears, happy that she gets to fight Desire. She prepares her ice magic and launches it towards him, but Desire counters it with a fire bolt. She then creates two magic circles to launch water magic from one ring but Desire counters with fire. Blue Hair uses the second circle to turn her water column into ice. The ice column breaks, launching ice shards at Desire. Desire steps back and commends her ingenuity while blocking the ice shards. She generates a tornado with the ice fragments. She tells Desire a commoner like him will never be able to use such powerful magic. She asks him for his last words, but Desire calls her a weak clown. He claims that she cannot control her magic at all, because she cannot aim it at his vital spots. This angers her and she tells him to shut his mouth. Desire inverses her magic and the tornado disperses. She is surprised he was able to stop her magic but then she notices his inverse magic. He tells her not to ever underestimate her opponent and creates an ice spike to fire at her. Blue Hair creates an ice shield, telling Desire his commoner magic can't beat her royal garbage magic. But Desire just laughs as he eliminates her. Meanwhile, Romantica tells Pram they were lucky to be teleported next to each other. Pram asks her if Desire would be alright by himself. Romantica summons Wind to detect Desire's location. She senses three people nearby. Two Alpha class participants emerge and tell her that she revealed her location after using detection magic. They call her a dumb beta student. Pram unsheathes his sword and Romantica tells them it's time to find out who the real trash is. The male participant tells her it's a certainty they will win. But Pram hardly allows him to finish his sentence before attacking him. He blocks Pram's strike, and Romantica tells Pram the guy isn't so weak after all. Pram and the guy attack each other but they block each of their attacks. The guy jumps back and Pram rushes towards him but the girl casts her magic, releasing multiple balls to strike Pram. Pram dashes around them to dodge. The guy tells Pram not to get too confident and creates a cloud of dust. The guy tells his partner to use her area magic to blow Pram and Romantica away. She tries to do it, but Romantica uses detection magic to find them and she casts a wind strike towards them. The girl is taken out, and she surrounds the mage with a whirlwind. Pram comes behind him, but the guy tries to strike Pram. But Pram dodges by leaping into the air. He follows Pram's path into the air and Romantica bids him goodbye. Her strike eliminates him. Pram and Romantica celebrate their victory, but she suddenly turns to a bush. She asks how long he's going to hide and watch them. Desire comes out and tells them that they are both doing well. A huge storm cloud slowly appears, and some red lightning streaks are seen in the sky. There are just 18 participants left. Desire tells his group there are two ways they can advance to the Alpha class. The first is to clear the Shadow World and finish in first place. The second is to survive till the end and be one of the top 9 participants. Romantica asks him if he thinks they can clear the Shadow World. He tells her there's no way because they will be going against the Alpha class. But they can aim for the top 9. He tells them if they can eliminate 9 out of the remaining 18 parties, they will be victorious. Suddenly it begins raining and Pram points towards a tree they can take shelter under. Romantica asks what they should do. Suddenly, they hear a bell and Desire tells them it's time for the previous clock tower. The tower shoots a beam of lightning into the sky and the announcer reveals a survival quest has begun. The participants must survive the demon attack. Desire and his party hear a scream in the distance, and it is announced there are 17 participants left. Suddenly, Desire notices movement underground. The demon emerges, scaring both Pram and Romantica. They run to Desire to save them from the Kuldra rat monster. Desire explains the Kuldra mouse is capable of controlling swarms of rats. They feed on human blood, and they never let their prey out of their sight. Romantica tries a magic attack but it's useless against the swarm. Desire tells her to keep running. They come against a huge fallen tree. Desire tells Pram to jump over the tree but Romantica refuses. He tells her she would become dinner for the rats if she doesn't and that was all the motivation she needed. They both jump over the tree but Romantica lands in her face. They keep running and Desire tells her they must kill the one controlling them. Romantica tells him they can't possibly find that one among the horde and he tells her there's a way to do so. Desire stops, bites his finger, and sprays some blood on the rats. The leader of the rats jumps towards the blood drops first and Desire tells Romantica to use her magic. Romantica shoots a wind bullet to knock down the leader, but the monster gets back up. Desire thinks Romantica became Secura 2.0 and asks them to retreat. 
However, Pram refuses to and rushes towards the swarm of rats. The swarms swallow up Pram and he looks out for the rat leader. Meanwhile, Desire is trying to get to Pram through the swarm, when suddenly, Pram emerges from the swarm. The announcer tells the Kildra mouse has been eliminated and the survival quest is over. Desire catches Pram as he collapses from exhaustion. They thank him for his good work, and he immediately falls asleep. Desire asks Romantica to look after Pram for a bit, and walks off. Desire thinks the quest could have been cleared without Pram getting injured. He thinks he became arrogant because of his growth rate and blames himself. He punches himself as a reminder to make sure his friends don't get brought down in the future. He walks back to Romantica, who notices the bruise on his face. She asks him what happened, but he simply asks how Pram is doing. Pram wakes up and Desire tells him they need to get going because he has found the previous clock tower. Later, Aziz's group also arrives at the previous clock tower. They think they have a good chance of clearing the shadow world if they stop the clock tower. Suddenly, Aziz figures that someone is using a detection magic spell. She looks up and sees several air balls coming, but she uses an ice wall to shield herself. Dodo and Percival also shield themselves from the attack, but the other members aren't so lucky. Aziz realizes that the only person who can perform detection magic followed by an instantaneous attack is Desire. Meanwhile, Desire's group is already inside the tower and there are just 15 participants left. Aziz's group quickly ran up the steps to the clock tower, but they keep getting attacked. Aziz predicts the direction of the attack and blocks it. They keep getting attacked by wind balls. Another attack knocks Dota and Aziz off the side of the steps. And Zizest is almost caught by a follow-up attack, but she blocks it. Romantica apologizes to Desire that her attacks were blocked. Desire tells her it's okay because it's Aziz's party. Romantica tells him to move because Aziz now knows their location. But Desire tells her it's fine and they should attack the next group coming in. Romantica asks him if he's crazy. She tells him if they keep attacking parties, everyone will gather around them. A new group comes near the tower and Desire tells her to trust him. Romantica starts attacking the new party and she takes them out. Now there are only 13 participants left. Desire uses this chance to walk towards a wall and casts his inversion magic. Aziz finally makes it inside the tower. They see two other parties who are getting ready to battle it out. Gabriel accuses Aziz's group of resorting to cheap tricks just to win the tournament. Aziz tells him they were attacked as well. Aziz asks Gabriel's reasoning, but in short, Aziz should be the only student able to cast high-level magic in a row. Aziz finally understands Desire's goal. Nobody would ever believe that magic would be cast by a beta-class student. Gabriel casts a huge flame magic spell at her. But Aziz appears by Gabriel's teammate's side and smashes his nose in with her feet. She uses her ice magic to freeze the female. Gabriel panics and turns to the other party to ask them for assistance. The party agrees with Gabriel and they engage. The leader shoots an arrow at Aziz but she deflects the arrow. Gabriel attacks her with a column of fire but she counters it with her ice. Meanwhile, Desire and his party are hiding on a floor above the others. After a while, they hear footsteps and Aziz comes with her party up the stairs. Aziz tells Desire that his plan failed. He aimed to make the Alpha students eliminate each other. But Aziz merely restrained the others without eliminating them. Desire tells her she got the better of him. Aziz is disappointed Desire resulted in such dirty tactics. Dona walks towards Romantica while Percival walks in front of Pram. Aziz tells Desire to fight her if he wants to be worthy of the single ranker title. Aziz summons an ice column that lifts her and Desire upwards, taking them to the next floor. Percival attacks Pram while he's distracted but Pram blocks it. Romantica wants to help Pram, but Dona stops her. He wants to pay her back. Desire sits on the floor and Aziz tells him to get up. Desire activates his magic, and several stones fly at Aziz. A stone catches her on the arm and forms two serpents, but she freezes them. Desire inverses the whole room and destroys Aziz's ice column. Meanwhile, Pram is engaged in a heated battle with Percival. Percival keeps slashing but Pram blocks all his attacks. Percival cancels Pram's block and headbutts him. Pram almost loses his balance and Percival tells him to swing around his great sword like he did previously. Pram tells him he talks too much for someone with tiny lips. The insult hits a nerve and Percival strikes out at Pram but he dodges it. Percival keeps trying to get Pram with his attack but Pram dodges them all perfectly. Percival is wondering why his swordsmanship isn't working. Pram gets him with a kick to the torso and Percival falls on one knee. Percival asks Pram how he became so much stronger in such a short time. Pram tells him he won't answer, and Percival can't believe a beta-class trash is stronger than him. Romantica attacked Donta with her wind strike. 
Donta blocks the strike and calls her weak. Romantica isn't very good at close combat and she's running out of mana. Suddenly the ice columns break, generating a mist. Donta loses sight of Romantica. Suddenly, his arm is hit by a wind strike. Another attack is cast but he blocks it this time. Donta figures out that Romantica uses wind magic and thinks she's pathetic. Romantica hopes to use the mist to her advantage to defeat Donta before it dissipates. Donta's necklace jingles and it emanates magic which dispels the mist. Romantica is surprised and Donta attacks her. Romantica dodges his strike, but she loses her balance and falls. Donta tries to strike her, but she rolls out of danger. Romantica gets on her feet, and she recognizes the necklace as the artifact Donta once gave her. Donta tells her it was far too good for a commoner like her. Romantica tells him commoners and nobles can't be so different since they are both students in the same school. She tells him his discrimination against commoners won't change anything. Donta tells her everything about a noble that differentiates them from commoners as soon as they're born. He creates a circle around her. She jumps out of the circle, but he puts another one. She tries to use her magic to stop flames, but he blasts her using the magic circle under her. She slams into the wall and falls to the floor. Pram runs to her to give her some help. Romantica tells Pram to hold Donta off while she regains some mana. Donta uses magic to raise stone columns and crush Pram. He then jumps to strike Romantica. Pram cuts through the rocks and attacks Donta but he dodges it. Donta wasn't quick enough though and Pram gives him a cut on his cheek. Donta tries to counter but Pram dodges it as well. Pram lands beside Romantica and Donta angry that a commoner dares to attack him. Percival tells Donta that Pram is his opponent, but Donta tells him he would defeat both Pram and Romantica. Pram tells Romantica something is wrong with Donta because he went straight to attack her without regard for his surroundings. Romantica wonders what she's going to do since her mana is low, and she can't beat Donta without magic. Romantica doesn't want to be a burden to Pram. She asks him to take Percival somewhere else. Romantica tells Pram to leave Donta to her so he can fight Percival alone. She's sending him away because she doesn't want to be a burden. But Pram rejects her suggestion and tells her they all have to become single rankers. Romantica thanks Pram for his reassurance. Meanwhile, Aesis tells Desire he has used up his bag of tricks and unlike the first exam, there's no finish line to save him. She creates an ice trail but Desire inverses it. She uses her magic circle to move around but Desire inverses it. Desire but he inverses it once again. Desire casts a spell of flames but Aesis dodges it. But before she can land properly, Desire creates a column of flames from underneath which catches Aesis off guard. But Aesis counters the flames with a cocoon of ice. Aesis can't understand how she's struggling to beat him. She outclasses him in combat skills and magic. Desire tells her she must learn to have some fun. She lunges at Desire, but he launches fireballs at her, yet she dodges them. She closes the distance, but he uses a spell to boost his strength and block her attack with a knife. She's surprised and he tells her he's also adept with a sword. She builds up momentum and pushes Desire into the wall. Desire is surprised by her power, but she doesn't give him time to remain amazed. She rushes at him and slashes at him continuously. He dodges each attack and Aesis becomes bewildered. She wonders how she can't beat Desire though she's much stronger than him. He asks her if she's having fun, but she doesn't understand what fun is. Desire tells her she probably hasn't faced a worthy opponent. Desire recalled how Aesis looked so bored in the past because battles weren't a challenge to her. Desire smiles asking her what she thinks of someone she can't reach. He riles her up to beat him with everything she's got, and she takes a deep breath. She tells him she may not be having fun, but she will beat him. Desire tells her to come at him and she raises an ice arena with an ice throne. Desire is impressed as he can't inverse this magic because it's vision magic. She sits on the ice throne and tells Desire to prepare himself. She summons huge ice spikes from beneath his feet. Desire jumps away but she uses ice spikes to keep him in position. She then sends an ice spike, but Desire uses his inverse magic to destroy them all. Desire knows she can use her magic limitlessly inside her vision magic arena. He remembered it as the trump card she used before he was brought back to the past. He's impressed she can already use it at this level. However, Desire inverses all the ice circles on the wall. He asks Aesis if she's at her limit and she gets angry. She tries to summon more circles, but Desire tells her attacks will never harm him. Aesis notices that each of her spells is immediately inversed as soon as she casts them. She then gets an idea. She picks up her sword and brings down the ice arena surrounding her. Desire sees Aesis fusing her sword with magic. Meanwhile, the battle between Pram and Donta continues. Pram dodges all his attacks and kicks Donta to the wall. Romantica asks him if he's alright. He tells her that Donta is strong, and she tells him they must take care of him before Parsifal decides to interfere. 
But at that moment, Dona asks Parsival to give him a hand. Parsival looks at him with disdain asking him if he can't take care of mere commoners. Parsival grabs his sword to join the battle. They both rush towards Pram simultaneously. Parsival jumps and throws his sword at Pram. Pram deflects Dona sneaking up on them from behind. Pram tries to protect Romantica, but Parsival and Dota rush at Romantica and Pram from opposite sides. Suddenly, time slows down, allowing Romantica to analyze the situation and remember Desire's motivational speech. Romantica tells Pram to get down and she points her fingers at them. She activates her magic and blasts them away. Meanwhile, Desire sees Aesis combining her magic with her sword to create a magic sword. A magic sword is the ultimate attack method that can only be used by magic knights. It takes about 10 years to master this technique, but Aesis was able to accomplish it in just 10 minutes. Aesis rushes towards him and he uses magic to send a storm of stones at her. She turned them all to ice and disintegrated them. Desire then sends a column of flames towards her, and she puts out the flames. She mocks Desire for being unable to inverse her current magic. She uses all her might to strike at him. She breaks his sword and tells Desire she has won but she's on some strong Jinjutsu. She then realizes he's using his inversion magic, but she doesn't know what he's inverting. She looks around the room and it all begins to change form. Desire's inversion magic goes through the entire clock tower. The announcer tells the remaining participants that the quest has been cleared and the magical power of the clock tower has been severed. This is the end of the final round of the ranking tournament. Desire heaves a sigh of relief and Aesis continues staring with unbelief. The announcer announces Desire is the person who cleared the quest. Professor Bridget is delighted Desire came out with the win. But Professor Fergman looks like he's holding in a colossal fart. Professor Fergman is so furious he throws his staff in frustration. He refuses to acknowledge Desire as the true winner of the quest. During a meeting between the professors and the headmaster, Professor Fergman tells them that Professor Bridget must have used some illegal means to make Desire the winner. He tells them a commoner can't outdo a magic knight and clear a shadow world himself. A professor asks him if he's accusing Professor Bridget of leaking the contents of the tournament to Desire. The professor asks him for proof. He tells her a commoner like Desire clearing the shadow world is proof enough. Everyone in the meeting watched the battle in the shadow world and they didn't notice anything shady. Professor Fergman tells them to investigate. The headmaster tells one of the students to bring him his list. The professors wonder why the headmaster called the meeting since he already decided on the participants who would become single rankers. The professor tells them he wanted to get their opinions, even though they were rubbish and not worth listening to. The next day, Desire sits across from Aesis. He tells her the objective of their party was to reduce the number of Alpha class men to 9 by pitting them against each other. She saw right through his plans, and she knew they couldn't become single rankers without defeating them. Desire tells her he got to the clock tower before her to analyze its content. So, he had to stall for time to completely analyze it. He tells her he still had a hard time analyzing it because he was going one-on-one -on -one with her. But he would have been done for if her full squad had come at him all at once. Aesis finally understands he was looking at the big picture and not focused on the battle against her. She feels she was playing into his hands the entire time and accepts defeat. Desire tells her if her sword had come a bit faster it would have been a different result. Pram and Romantic arrive and begin to threaten Aesis, asking if she has any problem with Desire. Aesis gets up to leave because Professor Fergman wants to see her due to her defeat. She walks away and stops at the door. She then asks Desire if she can join their training. Romantica tells her she can't, but he tells her the time and location G. Romantica gets angry at Desire, but he tells them they need to get going to see Professor Bridget. When they get to her office, she commends them for a job well done. However, they didn't pass the test to join the Alpha class. Romantica asks her if she's kidding, and she confirms it. She just tells them she wants to surprise them. She congratulated them for being promoted to the Alpha class. They eat cake to celebrate, and Bridget remembers when Young Desire first approached her. He was still a young kid who asked her to teach him magic. Back then, she taught him some basic spells and he quickly mastered them. She is impressed by how strong he has gotten since then. To celebrate their promotion, the group decides to go out and have fun. However, Romantica notices that Desire isn't happy about it. He explains they will be part of the Alpha class after the break, but she thinks that's more than enough reason to have fun right now. Mostly, because once they join, they will get busy. Pram also shows up his shining hype, telling Desire to have fun. In the end, our boy gives up and decides to have some fun. They enter the shopping mall, where Romantica uses the time to try out several new clothes. The guys evaluate her looks, but Desire doesn't seem so impressed as Pram. He simply says that she looks good on everything, 
making her mad for his lack of excited feedback. She decides to try even new stuff, but this time, Desire starts giving several compliments. Romantica feels happy about herself, until she notices that Desire is talking about Pram, who is also trying on new clothes. Desire then finds himself in the awkward squat position, barely holding himself because Pram is taking thousands of years to pick him a tie. Pram keeps pondering the colors and its meaning, forcing Desire to tell Romantica with his eyes that he needs some help. She tells him it's impossible because they cannot do something about Pram's indecisiveness. After 3,000 years, they finally get Desire a necktie. Romantica even complains that Pram took way more time to pick his stuff when compared to herself. They then notice a new store and are excited to get inside. Desire thinks they're too energetic, when suddenly Aziz calls his name. Desire is surprised that she's there and she asks if the shopping mall doesn't suit her. Desire denies, and Azist explains that sometimes she needs a change of pace. Desire then decides to invite her to join them in the arcade, but she turns more serious than she already is. She thinks this is a chance to take revenge for the ranking battle. Desire tries to explain this is just to have fun, and Azist replies she was kidding. Still, nobody really knows, because she's always serious. She accepts the invitation and they decide to join Pram who's trying to get some plush from the arcade machine. He happily manages to get his teddy bear, but they freak out when they notice Desire alongside Aziz. They angrily ask what is she doing there, and Desire simply mentions she will have fun with them. Suddenly, Aziz picks up Pram as if she was a robot and places him by Desire's side. She asks if everything is better, and Pram quickly turns from angry to happy. He tells her to join them and have fun. Romantica cannot believe this and calls him a traitor. Desire then notices something and points at it, asking if they should play it. They form up teams, but Pram complains he wanted to be in Desire's team instead of Azist's. Desire laughs it out, mentioning they can be together next time. But Romantica gets serious. They're about to start the game and everyone turns serious. Desire tells Romantica they're about to face the top swordsman and the magic knight in the academy. Therefore, she cannot let her guard down. She looks at Pram, who starts showing up his aura and promises to finish the game quickly so he can join Desire's party. The disc hits the air hockey table and Pram strikes it. Desire thinks this is too fast but manages to defend. Aziz tries to score, but Romantica hits the disc and uses her wind magic to score a point. Pram and Aziz cannot believe they just got beaten. They look at Romantica, who shows her wind aura, asking if they dare to challenge her. Desire, however, knows he's doomed. He tells her that magic is forbidden, but Aziz decides to also go serious. She hits the disc, but Romantica thinks this is too easy. Aziz suddenly uses her ice magic to create a wall and change the disc direction. Pram thinks this point was quite amazing. Desire realizes that Aziz hates to lose, but that only motivates Romantica to give it her all. Everyone uses their abilities to play the game, reminding Desire about their skills from his past life. This allows Aziz's team to score a point. They continue playing and Romantica tells Desire to pay attention. The disc is coming their way and Aziz used her ice magic. Desire uses his skill to inverse the ice and smashes the disc straight into their net. Aziz cannot believe it but asks if he's finally taking it serious. Desire simply replies the game is about to start. After having so much fun it's time to part a ways. Desire thanks Aziz for hanging with them, but she reveals that it was nice to have some fun. Romantica is pretty happy however, because they won't see Aziz in the near future. Pram and Desire is confused by that statement because, not only they're on the same class, but Desire also invited her to train with them. Romantica realizes her mistakes, admitting that she forgot about it. Days later, they finally enter the Alpha classroom and notice how it looks way better than the Beta one. Pram is also happy because he got a tablet to help study, but he has a Desire wallpaper. She's happy with all the conditions, but she's shocked to see Desire, who tells her it's time for their morning training. They get back to their training room with Aziz and start warming up. Aziz is assigned to train her sword skills with Pram and manages to block the attacks. Desire then shows her the magic control training that he forced Romantica to do. Aziz lifts the ball to put it on the other circle but fails midway. Romantica uses this chance to show off. She lifts the ball and moves it at high speed, and suddenly stops when it reaches the circle. She is proud to finally beat Aziz, until Desire brings out five more balls. Her tax is to control them at the same time and do the same. She manages to do it, but Desire doesn't stop. He brings out 10 balls in total, but she uses them to get revenge on him. However, during the training period, Romantica starts giving Aziz some tips on how to control her magic. 
By the end of the session, Aesis realizes that Desire developed an optimal training that suits everyone's aptitudes. Desire tells her they will be continuing their training after class and Aesis leaves. However, Romantica is completely exhausted. She complains this session was too harsh, but Desire replies they have no time left. She asks if what he told them in the other days is true. Desire confirms their next battle will be a real one. If they make a wrong move, it could cost them their lives. Despite being rough, he wants them to be stronger. Pram claims that he trusts Desire and Romantica also gets up, mentioning she doesn't doubt him. During class, the teacher explains humanity is still at war in shadow worlds. She reveals this calamity happens once a year and engulfs their whole world. And that's the reason why their world lost half of its land. However, their current Shadow World subjugating rate is nearly 100%. She explains that's thanks to being able to use Altea. She explains that Altea is crystallized mana that can be obtained by clearing Shadow Worlds. However, it contains a huge amount of mana and cannot be used as it is. But 50 years ago, the Tower of Magic managed to find a processing technique that allowed them to use Altea. And as a result, that mana was produced to benefit humanity, creating trains, tablets, phones, between others. She asks if someone knows who created this processing technique and picks Romantica to answer. But turns out, she was asleep during class and didn't know the answer for a question she didn't hear. Desire helps her by saying it was Zod Exarian, the master of the tower. The teacher confirms it's the right answer and Desire teases her, telling she needs to hear the class. She complains about how hard his training sessions are, but he laughs it off. The class ends and Desire's group approaches the teacher. She doesn't know their names, but Desire introduces himself. She realizes he's the beta class student who became a single ranker and thinks he has some questions. Desire, however, has a request for her. She thinks he wants his party to be sponsored because every party is allowed to ask for sponsorship from the academy or the Tower of Magic. However, the application period is already over. Desire replies she's wrong. He pulls a paper and tells her that's his request. She reads it and finds it weird because it's a commission form. She notices it's a Tower of Magic Yearly Guard mission. She's confused but he explains the Academy should be able to give a commission to each party. The teacher confirms and Desire asks her to be allowed to have that commission. However, she rejects it because she doesn't have a reason for it. She asks why he wants that commission that he just invented. Desire asks if the Lugenel's tier Altea is kept inside the Yuri Tower branch. The teacher has a strange reaction and asks him how he knows that secret. Desire simply replies that in 10 hours, a group of people will steal it. She's surprised to hear it but gets shocked when Desire says it's the Outers. She thinks about the secret item and the group who wants to steal it. She then asks how he knows so much, despite being a beta class student some days ago. Desire claims he doesn't have time to explain because if she doesn't accept the commission, the Altea will be stolen. He tells her to think again and give them the commission because she's the only person who can do it. Ten hours later, the master of the Tower of Magic receive an urgent message. The Yurili branch is under attack. The master realizes that everything was true and checks his tablet, where Desire's file is open. He looks at it and asks who is Desire. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.